Thank you, David, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have given by now a few hundred talks on campuses, uh, the worst of which by far was at uh, UC Berkeley, which was an extraordinary event for me and for those who were there. Um, but most strikingly, of late, I've had no disturbances, not since October. I don't know if this is a trend, if it's just my own quirky personal experience, but I was, in fact, at Berkeley in April, and it was quiet, uh, as well as every other university. I'm not sure if this suggests that the other side has decided that that tactic is not a useful one and that it should leave us alone, or whether they're dispirited or whether they're retrenching, or I don't know what, but it is of note, at least for me. I thought since we have uh, three students and ex-students uh, to speak about their personal experiences rather than tell you about my own, which like David's are you know, quick, I go in for a few hours and I leave, I would rather uh, build on what his initial comments suggested is the background to this, namely the connection between the left and the Islamists, or the red and the green. And when I suggested to David I talk about the red and the green, he thought I was going to talk about environmentalists. He wasn't too happy, but no, green in this case is the green flag of Islam. And I think this will be a useful background for the extraordinary stories you'll be hearing. Now, first I'd like to document it and then explain why this should be. And the documentation is, is interesting. Let me give you three examples of Latin American leftists and Iran. Here are two brother countries united like a single fist, said Hugo Chavez recently on a visit to Tehran. Uh, the son of Che Guevara visited Tehran last year and he declared that his father would have supported the country in its current struggle against the United States. Fidel Castro beat them both, was there in 2001, and he told his host that Iran and Cuba, in cooperation with, another, with one another, can bring America to its knees. But it's, of course, not just Latin American leftists. Uh, Ken Livingston, the former mayor of London, literally embraced Yusuf al-Qaradawi, the Islamist thinker. Ramsey Clark, our former attorney general, our most embarrassing attorney general, uh, visited Ayatollah Khomeini and vowed his support. Noam Chomsky visited Hezbollah not long ago and gave his support. Workers World had a moving tribute to Imad Mohnia, the recently killed uh, arch-terrorist of Hezbollah. And then some of the leftists actually convert to Islam. Carlos the Jackal, Ilich Ramez Sanchez converted, Roger Garoudi, the French communist leader, Jacques Verger, another French communist leader, Yvonne Ridley, the British journalist, and H. H. Rep. Brown, the American black leader. There's a long history of such cooperation. During the Cold War, for example, the Islamists were more friendly towards the Soviet Union than the United States. And in return, the left was more friendly towards the Islamists. In 1978, the famed Michel Foucault went to Tehran and he called Ayatollah Khomeini a saint. Our own Andrew, Jack, Andrew Young, uh, a year later, called Khomeini some kind of saint. Now, this in, is a surprise, really, at base, because leftists are atheists and Islamists execute atheists. The left exalts workers, and Islamism privileges Muslims. One dreams of a worker's paradise, and the other dreams of a caliphate. Socialists want socialism, and Islamists want the free market, more or less. Marxism implies gender equality, and Islamism oppresses women. Leftists despise slavery, and Islamists endorse it. At least some of them do. Or as Brett Stevens put it in the Wall Street Journal not long ago, the left has devoted, quote, the last four decades championing the very freedoms that Islam most opposes, sexual and reproductive freedoms, gay rights, freedom from religion, pornography, and various forms of artistic transgression, pacifism, and so on, unquote. So what's up? Why this alliance, one that David documented in a book he called Unholy Alliance? I'll give you four reasons quickly. First, shared enemies. As the British politician George Galloway explained, quote, the progressive movement around the world, and the Muslims have the same enemies, unquote, meaning Western civilization in general, the United States, Britain, and Israel in particular, and of course, George Bush most especially of all. They use the same words. It's quite interesting. Listen to Harold Pintner, Pinter, the British playwright. America is a country run by a bunch of criminal lunatics. And then here's bin Laden. The country is unjust, criminal, and tyrannical. 
He was Noam Chomsky. America is a leading terrorist state. Here's a Pakistani leading uh, Islamist by the name of Hafiz Hussein Ahmed. It is the biggest terrorist state in the world. So shared enemies, one. Two, similar goals. I think it was symbolically started in 2003 with the massive joint uh, demonstrations against the forthcoming war in Iraq, especially in London and elsewhere around the world. Both sides want the coalition forces to lose in Iraq. They want the war on terror to be closed down. They want to spread anti-Americanism. They want to eliminate the Jewish state of Israel. They agree on massive immigration to the West and multiculturalism in the West. So shared goals, number two. Three, they have historic and philosophical ties. Said Qutb, for example, the very key Egyptian Islamist thinker, accepted the Marxist notion of stages of history, except he added another one after socialism, and that would be the Islamic era after more broadly, the analyst that David referred to earlier, the uh, author of Reading Lolita in Tehran, Azar Nafisi, has observed that Islamism, quote, takes its language, goals, and aspirations as much from the crassest forms of Marxism as it does from religion. Its leaders are as influenced by Lenin, Sartre, Stalin, and Fanon as they are by the prophet, unquote. So the Islamists look to the left, but the left also looks to the Islamists. Here's Oscar Lafontaine, a former chairman of Germany's Social Democratic Party, and he outlined what they have in common. Quote, Islam depends on community, which places, in it, which places, it, places it in opposition to extreme individualism, which threatens to fail in the West. In addition, the devout Muslim is required to share wealth with others. The leftist also wants to see the strong help the weak, i.e., We've got a lot in common, says LaFontaine. Dennis Kucinich, this is my favorite example, <laughs> during his first campaign for president, which was more colorful than his second one, he quoted the Quran, he visited mosques, and he actually roused the Muslim audience at one point to chant, Allahu Akbar, God is great. And he even went so far as to announce that I have a copy in the Quran in my, of the Quran in my office. So point one. They have the same enemy, point two, the same goals or similar goals, point three, they have historic and philosophical ties, and point four, and finally, each side benefits from this alliance. We see this in particular on the campus, but more broadly, Islamism fulfills the predictions of Marx, the dialectical material dialectical materialism of Marx. Now, as David mentioned, these were all wrong. But Marx forecasted that business profits would collapse in industrial countries, prompting the bosses to squeeze the workers. The proletariat would become impoverished, rebel, and establish the socialist order. None of this happened, and especially became clear in the mid-20th century. So in lieu of the proletariat, which disappointed the left, the Marxists have been looking for some alternative. One was Gramsci's idea, then you have the idea of dependencia, and all sorts of elaborations on Marx's basic notion that someone is going to turn up and destroy capitalism. Well, guess what? Someone turned up. Not the right people, not the ones who expected, not with the right motives, but 9-11. What a glory for Marxism, no? Finally, someone has really given a punch in the face to the West. They are fulfilling Marxist predictions in their own strange way. The leftists tend to see the Islamists as their cannon fodder. What a remarkable thing it was for the leftist leaders in London in 2003 to have a million people out there. Leftists don't address a million people. And they, re they responded with exhilaration. I've already quoted Michel Foucault, but he's so important he deserves a second quote. In 78, when he went to Iran, he felt an exhilaration at watching an actual revolution take place and violence take place, exalted, holy violence. This was wonderful stuff. Or to go to 9-11, the German composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen said that it was, quote, the greatest work of art for the whole cosmos, unquote. Norman Mailer, a little more restrained, called its perpetua perpetua perpetrators, quote, brilliant. And Jean Baudrillard, a French philosopher, portrayed the perpetrators 
as slaves rebelling against a repressive order. So that's on the leftist side. Admiration and delight that the Islamists have turned up to fulfill the Marxist prophecies. On the Islamist side, it's a little more cunning and less exhilarated. It's more a sense that the left has a lot to offer them in terms of legitimacy, access, skills, and firepower. So, for example, when Shabina Begum wanted to wear a jilbab, which is an outfit on a woman that covers all but the hands and face, to her high school in Britain, it was Sherry Booth, the wife of then Prime Minister Tony Blair, who argued her case at the appellate court. When Omar, when Omar Abdurrahman, the blind sheikh, wanted to foment revolution in Egypt, it was his leftist lawyer, Lynn Stewart, who helped him get the message out to Egypt and broke the law and is now in jail. To prevent Dutch politician Pim Fortein from making Muslims into what he called scapegoats, Volkert van der Graaf, an animal rights fanatic, killed Pim Fortein. My favorite, to get Jamil El Banna, a Guantanamo suspect who'd been released into Britain out of jail, known, none other than Vanessa Rengrave funded half of his 50,000 pound bail surety. On another note, leftists founded the International Solidarity Movement, which obstructs the Israeli security forces from protecting the country against Hamas and other Palestinian terrorists. So you see, the university is just one element. It's a very important element, but it fits into a larger universe of left Islamist cooperation, red-green alliance, that is vital and is very dangerous. And one of its key uh, venues is the university, but it's by no means the only one. It is a little bit reminiscent of the Red-Brown Alliance of 1939, but this is a deeper one, a longer-lasting one, and I would say ultimately it has greater dangers for all of us and particularly on the campus. So over to you who will talk about the campus in, sp in specifics.